speakers who have done a wonderful job of introducing nicotine addiction, the neurobiology of nicotine addiction, and some of the models that I'll be talking about. So I'm not actually going to talk about or do my introduction on nicotine addiction. I think you guys are good to go with that. I have already assessed your ability, and you're good. So, so what I will do is I will start by talking about diabetes. So just to give you a background for those of you who are not familiar with diabetes, you know, once a person eats a meal, insulin is released from the pancreas, and that insulin is there to promote uptake of glucose into various uh, organs in the body. And um, if the person has the inability to produce insulin, or if that insulin is no longer able to have an effect in the system, then you will end up having too much glucose in your body, i.e. hyperglycemia, which on the long term can produce many uh, significant health issues in a person. So in type 1 diabetes, you have patients or persons who uh, have deficits in producing and synthesizing and releasing uh, insulin from the pancreas. And in type 2 diabetes, you are oftentimes seeing insulin resistance, which is associated with obesity. And in insulin resistance, the insulin is not able to produce its effect. So insulin is there, but the body does not respond to insulin very well. So given that you have a situation where in both cases you end up having hypoglycemia, there are many different uh, health consequences, negative health consequences that can occur in uh, people with diabetes. And that, those effects are significantly magnified by chronic uh, opiate, um, chronic nicotine use or tobacco use. Will this thing work for me? Let me just click on this. Or... Click there. Okay. Let's, okay. So um, I think the first thing that we all uh, think about about diabetes and and uh, nicotine is that the last thing that a person who has diabetes should be doing is smoking. And uh, I think that's pretty much accepted. That's that we we think about that as as uh, two bad combinations together. The consensus that diabetic persons that use tobacco is to control their weight and their appetite. Um, and this is, you know, this is somewhat logical because, you know, nicotine has been used uh, as an appetite suppressant. It does have appetite suppressing properties. And uh, that being said, we believe that there's more to the story than that when it comes down to people who are, uh, have diabetes and uh, smoke. In fact, if you look at the clinical literature and epidemiological literature, you realize that there are reports indicating that those who have um, who have uh, diabetes have greater pleasurable effects of smoking. They are, are less likely to quit smoking if they're diabetic. Uh, those that are diabetic are more concerned with body weight gain if they quit and also display high rates of depression and anxiety during their abstinence periods once they quit smoking. So on that note, what we wanted to do is we first we wanted to see whether or not diabetic, the diabetic state in any way, shape, or form enhances the pleasurable effects of nicotine. So what we did was we first started with developing a model or using an already developed model of type 1 diabetes, which is administration of streptozoidocine, which is a toxin that's able to get into the pancreas and destroy the insulin-producing beta cells of the pancreas. So essentially it fries the beta cells, and the person who's been exposed or the animal who's been exposed to streptozoidocine will have significant deficits, if not complete lack of insulin production and release in the body. Um, so we, we treated our rats with streptozoidocine. Some days later, we placed the animals in a, an extended access nicotine self-administration paradigm. So they're in the self-administration boxes for 23 hours a day, and they love press for nicotine. And essentially, we had some control animals who did not get streptozoidocine, so they were just healthy animals with normal blood glucose who were either placed in a saline condition or nicotine self-administration condition. And then we had uh, diabetic animals who either had intermediate levels of high glucose levels or really high levels of glucose levels, those being about 300 milligrams or uh, upwards of 500 milligrams of uh, glucose, uh, milligrams per deciliter of glucose. So when we actually looked at the lever pressing of nicotine for these animals, what we noticed is that uh, on the y-axis, we have average responses, upper responses, that means average number of level presses, and on the x-axis, we have the different conditions. Clearly, animals who are not diabetic still level press for nicotine because it does produce a pleasurable effect 
However, interestingly, animals who were given STD, streptozoidin, that means that they were diabetic, in fact produced a higher level of lever pressing for nicotine compared to those that were not diabetic. So diabetes, at least streptozoidin induced diabetes, did significantly enhance the lever pressing for nicotine. Okay? We were able to reverse this by treating the animals with insulin. If you give those animals insulin and place them in this lever pressing procedure again, the insulin treated animals are able to attenuate the, or exhibit a lower level of lever pressing compared to those that were not treated with insulin. Essentially showing that we are dealing with a system that is sensitive to insulin and that insulin can reverse the enhanced pleasurable effects of nicotine. So we wanted to extend this finding by looking at uh, another model, which is the condition place preference paradigm. A number of speakers here have already spoken about or demonstrated or explained to you what condition place preference is. We use two different models in the condition place preference paradigm. We use the streptozoidocene induced model like we had before, but we also looked at another model of diabetes which is considered to be similar to a type 2 model of diabetes, and this is where the animals are uh, given a high fat diet regimen and uh, therefore uh, develop an insulin resistance and, there, and as such are considered to be a model of type 2 diabetes. And we went through a nicotine condition place preference uh, uh, study with a very standard type of a procedure that has been commonly used in other laboratories. And what I have on this graph is on the y axis, we have different scores. This is the difference between the amount of time that they previously liked the compartment before getting nicotine versus the time that they received the nicotine. Uh, and this is animals that are currently in a drug free state. So if they were conditioned with I don't see. Okay, there we go. So on the Y, on the X axis, we have different doses of nicotine. These are the conditioning doses of nicotine they had received. And what we see is that animals who were treated with streptozoidocine, that is, they were diabetic, in fact developed a much stronger place preference for nicotine compared to those that were not. And this is most apparent in the lower doses of nicotine. Wow, that's that nice. Maybe I'll go a little better. I like. Uh, there we go. So lower doses of nicotine. Um, so essentially showing that, uh, again, these diabetic animals have an enhanced rewarding effect of nicotine. If we were to take these animals and treat them with STZ, then that enhanced nicotine reward is diminished and gone away. So essentially showing again that it's an insulin dependent effect at this point. Uh, we also extended our study and looked at the type 2 model. These are the insulin resistant animals. This graph essentially is demonstrating that the animals are indeed insulin dependent or insulin resistant, I, I apologize. So on the y-axis here is the blood glucose levels of the animals. On the x-axis is time after an insulin challenge dose. So this is an insulin ch uh, challenge test to see if the animals are indeed uh, ins uh, are, um, insulin resistant. And what we see is that animals who were given a high-fat diet split into two groups. Some animals are indeed insulin resistant, so that means that when you give them insulin, their, insulin, their blood glucose levels dips down a little bit, but not a whole lot. And we have animals whose insulin uh, resistance is not there, so that means that their response is just like your normal healthy animal, and if you give them insulin, their blood glucose levels dies down, uh, just like an untreated, controlled, naive animal. If you look at the body weight of these animals, all the animals who received a high-fat diet did gain weight regardless of if they were insulin resistant or not. However, some of them became insulin resistant, some of them did not. And this is important to keep in mind because when we look at the actual rewarding effect of nicotine in our type 2 diabetic animals, what we see is that animals who wear insulin resistance, which are the black bars, exhibit a greater place preference, i.e. greater rewarding effect for nicotine as compared to our control animals. Importantly, if you give the high-fat diet animals uh, and those animals do not develop insulin resistance and you test them for this nicotine place preference, these animals actually do not show a nicotine place preference, meaning that they actually don't show, uh, they don't find nicotine pleasurable. This is actually not our, the first time that this data has been shown. Julie Blendy's lab from the University of Pennsylvania has also shown this both in humans and in mice, that obese individuals uh, do not seem to care a whole lot for nicotine, although that study did not control for whether or not those individuals or mice were insulin resistant and diabetic or not. 
All right, so knowing that uh, insulin and nicotine reward is enhanced in diabetic models, both type 1 and type 2 models of diabetes in animals, we were interested to see what, is it, what in the world is going on. What we do know is if you were to look at the reward circuitry in the brain, particularly the mesocortical limbic system that I'm referring to over here, not only do we have you know, many different types of receptors that other speakers have spoken about today, we also have insulin receptors. These insulin receptors are located both in the ventral tegmental area, this is where the dopamine neurons are housed in the brain, as well as uh, insulin receptors in the nucleus accumbens. This is where the dopamine is released and it's thought that many of the pleasurable effects of uh, the growth of abuse, including nicotine, is due to that release of dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. So what we did was we went ahead and measured dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. So what you have on the y-axis is just the amount of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens of the rat, and on the x-axis you have time. So this is just a time course study. What we show is animals that are diabetic, STG treated diabetic, in fact have lower dopamine levels, this is before they get any drug, compared to their naive counterparts. Once they do get nicotine, their dopamine levels are still lower compared to the non-diabetic animals. In fact, after nicotine, we see this trend, but not only is it unique to nicotine, it's also, unique, it's, it's also found in other drugs. So, for instance, acetamine, a drug that's known to really enhance dopamine levels in the nucleus cumbens, does that in the non-diabetic animals you see here, however, not so much in the diabetic animals. So, essentially, what this is showing is that diabetes suppresses, attenuates the dopamine functioning in the nucleus cumbens that we're seeing here. Okay, so we went ahead and decided to look at dopamine receptors. What we found is that the diabetic state attenuated D1 dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens. This is important because dopamine receptors overall, both D1 and D2, have been shown to be involved in drug reward processing for multiple drugs, including nicotine. So we're not getting a drug effect per se, we are getting a diabetic effect. So regardless if they're on nicotine or not, if they're diabetic, the D1 receptors are, are reduced. Uh, D2 receptors, we did not see a change in D2 receptors. We did see a difference in D1 receptors, however. We also looked at dopamine transporters. So these are uh, essentially pumps on the presynaptic side whose job is to take the dopamine from the synapse and push it back into the presynaptic terminal, essentially clear out the dopamine from the synapse. And what we notice is that in stephazosine or in diabetic animals, there is an increase in general of these dopamine transporters. So that means that we have more dopamine transporters. The chance are these, the more dopamine transporters we have are clearing out the dopamine from the synapse faster or more effectively than you would get from non-diabetic animals. This might explain why we have less dopamine in the nucleus cumbens of these animals, of the diabetic animals. So as a summary for what I've shown you so far uh, for the neurochemistry studies, we show that there's an enhancement in nicotine reward, and I've shown you that in both type 1 type 2 diabetic models and two type models of drug abuse. Uh, we show that there's a blunted dopamine release. We show that there's an increase in dopamine transport, which might, which might explain why there's a blunted dopamine release. And we also show that we have fewer D1 receptors in the nucleus accumbens. So to move on, we we're trying to figure out, well, how do you make sense of this? What could be responsible? What could be occurring as leading to these animals actually showing an enhancement and reward? And I have my own bias and with the directions to go to, and I have a background in, in molecular pharmacology, so I decided why not look at some molecular signaling of, uh, of these receptors. And what we understand is that receptors for dopamine and receptors for insulin utilize the same signal transduction molecules cells. That means that these receptors, once activated, can activate similar signaling or molecular pathways in the, in the brain. And I have three pathways here that I'm, I'm just focusing on, the cyclic AP pathway, the insulin receptor substrate pathway, the ATP pathway, some people call it, and the MAP kinase pathway. And for those of you who study self signaling, you understand that these are not linear pathways as much as we like to draw them linearly. 
And I love to talk about linear because it's convenient, but the reality is that although we draw these pathways linearly, oftentimes these molecules can interact with these molecules in a linear fashion, just to give you a heads up of understanding. And to those that are not molecular biologists, uh, these are not just simply letters that are connected together. These are actually names of certain proteins that are involved in cellular machinery. So, for instance, DARK32 is a cellular is a signaling molecule that is particularly found in dopamine neurons, and that if you were to increase in that drugs of abuse are known to enhance DARK32 activity and DARK32 dark, dark levels in the brain. And that if you were to attenuate or prevent increase in dark 30 levels, you can reduce the reward effect of certain drugs of abuse, including nicotine. Uh, likewise with AKT, AKT has been known to be linked to dopamine receptors as well as insulin receptors. In fact, the insulin receptor substrate that is over here is the primary driver for the downstream AKT molecule. Um, and also MAP kinase, particularly ERK1 and 2, which is also known as MAP kinase 42 and 44. These are molecules that are very much also involved in the drug reward process, and that if you were to give an animal uh, uh, drugs of abuse, you would see an increase in the activity in the levels of ERK, and that if you were to attenuate uh, activity of ERK, you were able to reduce the rewarding effect of these drugs. So what we did was we just went ahead and looked at diabetic animals and non-diabetic animals and measure these protein levels. The first one, I don't know how much how I'm doing with time. One minute? I'll speak. I'll, I'm, I'm almost done. All right, so the first one is essentially measuring phospho uh, insulin receptor substrate two levels in the nucleus accumbens. It's essentially a marker that if you have an, a reduction in IRS2 levels, that essentially means that your insulin signaling machinery in the cells are compromised, are reduced. That essentially means that your animals are diabetic. If your animals are diabetic, you would expect to see a decrease in insulin receptor substrate, and we are seeing that, in fact, here in our study. What we also see, interestingly, is that animals that are diabetic, none of these animals are taking nicotine. These are just diabetic versus non-diabetic. As those that are diabetic exhibit an increase in dark 32 levels, phosphorylation levels of dark 32. This is similar to what you would see in an animal who is taking drugs. But these animals are not taking drugs. These guys are just diabetic. You see the same effect in AKT. This is that molecule that's just downstream from uh, insulin receptor substrate. And interestingly, although that picture is kind of blocking it, you can still see it though, is earth levels are attenuated. So we have, out of the three markers that we know that are involved in the machinery for growth reward processing, two of them are enhanced, one of them is attenuated. This is just a snapshot of what's going on in a diabetic uh, brain. This is not a completely functional analysis. So we need to, at this point, figure out what in the world is going on and how does this, uh, this, this environment, this landscape that was produced uh, in the nucleus accumbens by diabetes lead to an enhancement in the reward process. So what does it all mean? It's work in progress. We're still trying to figure this out and we're working as hard as we can on it. Uh, the data that we show here uh, shows that the diabetic state produces a complex signaling landscape that may ultimately lead to mesolimbic reward processing to be primed in nicotine's action. So that means that the diabetic state might prime the brain such that that person might be more susceptible to drug abuse or that that person might find nicotine more pleasurable. Okay? Um, the whole concept of enhanced reward versus reward deficiency syndrome is, has to do with does, do these individuals or do these rats actually find nicotine to be more pleasurable to begin with, or is there a deficiency in their ability to affect uh, field pressure and therefore feel pleasure, and therefore they are lever pressing or taking the drug to compensate for that loss in their brain. In their brain. So these are things that are unknown and we're trying to figure it out. I just want to thank in members in my lab who work on it, members in uh, Laura, Laura O'Neill's lab, who's my dear collaborator, who's done the self demonstration studies and part of the, uh, the CPP study, Dr. Friedman, for inviting me, as well as our funding source. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more questions? Kevin, please
Are there more people who smoke in the diabetic population? There's a greater, if you were to look at percent of diabetic persons who smoke versus those that are not diabetic and who smoke, those that are diabetic smoke, there's a greater percent of diabetic persons who smoke versus not diabetic. But we don't know which causes which, so yeah, we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Smoking causes diabetes also. Yes, so, so we don't know who came first. All we know is that there is a, a, a noticeable um, you know, co-occurrence. Uh, you mentioned you did 23 hours in the cell administration a day. Why 23 hours? The 23 hours is really a more demonstration of what green life is. Oftentimes, if you fill up cell the station, you just put the animal in that block for one hour, and that's just one hour of your life. 